What's cracking, big dogs? Woo! Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat. And the more I draft, the more trends I pick up on. There are a few running backs. A few running backs we're going to go over in today's video that are getting drafted too high. I don't want to say they're on my official do not draft list, but where they're currently going per underdog ADP, all paid leagues. I will link that ADP down below. Way too damn high. We learn our lessons. Year over year, we get better at fantasy football, okay? We stunk like six years ago. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know how any of you guys listened to me or subscribed to my channel six years ago. I was bad. And then I got a little less bad. And then I got a little, little, little less bad after that. And then I got still bad, but a little bit better. But I'm at the point where I've learned a lot of damn lessons, okay? Been in the game for a minute. I've learned a lot of lessons, and a lot of them are starting to come to fruition. Thus, this video is coming together. It's coming together terribly because I need to put my social media on the screen because I need you guys to follow me, right? Hey, follow me at Nick Ercolano on Instagram and on Twitter. Today, we're talking about five running backs, three main running backs, and two honorable mentions that are going in that dead zone of the running back fantasy draft location, okay? Send the pin sex location. This is where the Todd Gurley's and Le'Veon Bell's fell in last year, where you don't want anything to do with them, and they're very easy to spot from a distance. Maybe some of you guys can't spot them, but I can, and that's why I'm here to tell y'all. And we're going to get more into the whole dead zone of running back situation at the end of the video, talk more of a general strategy uh, standpoint, okay? But right now, we're getting into five running backs that y'all are drafting far too high in 2021 fantasy football drafts before we get into it let's tuck our shirts in stop yelling let's see all right well the first guy up on my list here and this is going to come to a surprise for a lot of people okay and i actually wrote this a couple weeks ago prior to when the jamal williams news came out this is DeAndre Swift of the Detroit Lions, okay? He was a guy I was really, really high on last year. I own him in a lot of dynasty spots, uh, so I'm still very much in on the talent. The situation does not lend itself to the ceiling that a lot of people want him to hit this year in 2021. We got spoiled with the running back class last year, and we're all automatically assuming these guys are going to hit RB1 level, right? You got JT and Cam Akers getting drafted in the top 10, and you got Clyde over Tolaire and Antonio Gibson and DeAndre Swift. Now, DeAndre Swift right now is the RB16 off the board per underdog ADP at the 211, okay? RB16 is not too bad. I he probably has a floor of in the 15 to 20 range, but I don't see the ceiling getting much higher. And in the 211 spot, that second round pick is a little bit too spicy for me to pull the trigger on a guy that we are not really taking in the the risk factor here, okay? With a lot of these sophomore running backs, they have risk, but I feel like uh, DeAndre Swift has been told pretty much by the Lions that he's not going to be the three-down workhorse. That was the case last year, and that'll probably be the case this year, okay? Without them saying it, they basically told us that's going to be the case. Last year, Swift played on 38% of snaps, and I know Matt Patricia is gone, but Anthony Lynn is here, and Anthony Lynn is a guy who's always divvied up the opportunities, whether it's between Melvin Gordon and Austin Eckler or Austin Eckler and fat Josh Kelly last year. This is I have no confidence that Anthony Lynn's going to come in and be like, okay, DeAndre Swift is going to be our three-down workhorse. You have Dan Campbell coming over. He's coming over from the Saints, okay? Dan Campbell's coming over from the Saints, so he knows how to use running back, right? You look, you look at Alvin Kamara, and a lot of people have comped DeAndre Swift to Alvin Kamara. Very similar play styles. They're not like the best pure runners, but they're super athletic, super shifty, awesome in the passing game. And that is where I think Swift's points are going to come from this year. They're going to come from the passing game because Detroit's going to stink, okay? Vegas has them pinned at four and a half win total. Four and a half win total on 17 games, and the juice is on them going under. It's ridiculous, okay? Meaning they're going to trail a lot and meaning they're going to throw a lot. So can Swift see 70, 80 targets? on the season? Yes, he can. And would that be Alvin Kamara type stuff? Honestly, not really, because he's routinely above 100 targets, and I don't see Swift getting above 100 targets, but it's the same vein, right? It's the same, uh, most of your fantasy points are coming from the pass catching work. But what makes Kamara so valuable are the touchdowns, bro. Like the Saints always have an extremely fluid offense, and that volume is going to be nice for Swift, but Kamara's been elite because in his four years as an NFL player, he has scored 13, 18, and 21 touchdowns, okay? And in 2019, the bad year when he scored just six touchdowns, he was not really usable in fantasy whatsoever. And uh, the other thing is like Kamara, a lot of the time, the targets that he got a lot of the time were screenplays, and they were red zone targets, and they were manufactured touches to get him in open space 
space so that he's not, you know, it's not under pressure. It's not catch the ball and have 47 defensive backs right in your face hole as soon as you catch the ball. With DeAndre Swift, yes, we can project a lot of pass catching work because this team is going to be bad and trailing. You know, you're a trailing team. You're trying to throw the ball downfield. So DeAndre Swift is not going to be the first look for a guy like Jared Goff when they need to score 14 or 21 points or however much they're trailing by. So a lot of the dump offs are going to come under pressure. Uh, while there's a lot of risk involved, while there are other players closing in on the gaps on Swift. So I think, yes, raw targets are nice to see, but the targets that Kamara gets versus the targets that Swift are going to get under pressure are going to be a little bit different, okay? And the obvious elephant in the room here, while they got rid of Adrian Peterson, while they got rid of Carrion Johnson, they signed Jamal Williams, who will have a role immediately. And you look at, you know, basically what Anthony Lynn came in and said, referred to Jamal Williams as a classic A-back. My A-backs are normally my bigger backs. They can run between the tackles, block probably a little better than the B-back. They could also run the perimeter. I can leave those guys in there for all three downs. Now, they're not saying, they're not saying that, he's going to be a three-down workhorse, right? And Lynn also labeled DeAndre Swift as a speed space back. They're complementary backs to each other, and that's going to be a problem, right? Like, you have Jamal Williams, who he's saying he could run between the tackles, so he's going to get early down work. He can block a little better, which means he's probably going to leave him on the field for third downs, which means passing work being taken away from DeAndre Swift, okay? So that's going to be the problem. Williams is going to get a lot of empty carries, but he might get some of those goal line carries too, those fucking cream-filled jelly donut type carries that we need DeAndre Swift to get, the ones by the goal line, okay? Now, Swift is probably going to get somewhere between like 200 and 250 touches this year, but if he doesn't score a lot of touchdowns, which isn't easy to project in this offense that's going to win four games, he's going to get a pretty shitty ceiling. He's going to get a shitty ceiling with Jamal Williams coming into town, okay? So we are all buying into the talent of DeAndre Swift. We like him for dynasty. We like him long-term. This year, though, his ceiling, as long as Jamal Williams is healthy, is going to be frustrating as shit. Will he have good games? Of course he's going to have good games. He's a good player, and he's going to break off a few runs that are 60 yards or a screen pass that's 40 yards and take it to the crib. And on those weeks, you're going to be like, fuck, I wish I had DeAndre Swift. But more often than not, we're going to get 11 carries out of DeAndre Swift. We're going to get four targets for 26 yards and shit like that. And we're going to be like, damn, I wish I didn't use my second round pick on DeAndre Swift. So as much as I liked him last year, the ADP for Swift is just too damn high. Okay. Moving on to the next run. Bike, who's very similar to DeAndre Swift. That's Travis Etienne. Jacksonville Jaguars, first round pick this year. Second first round pick, 25th overall. Going off the board, RB22 at the 410. This is the even worse pick than DeAndre Swift. We know DeAndre Swift's role in Detroit, and it's going to be an okay one. It's going to be a good enough one where if if you do pick him at the end of the second round, like he's going to be your RB2, and you know what you're getting at him. With Travis Etienne, man, we have to be realistic about the situation that this man is going into. The offense already has James Robinson, and they have a ton of like other weapons there between DJ Chark, LaVisca Chenault, Marvin Jones coming in like how is ETN going to see any goal line carries there when Tim Tebow just signed and is an elite red zone weapon how how are we going to disperse the touches for Travis ETN when we have godlike characters on the field at all times for this Jaguar offense when you look at draft night when you go bike to what new head coach Urban Meyer has been saying about Travis Etienne. Speaking Thursday evening, Jaguars coach Urban Meyer said he envisioned the number 25 overall pick, Travis Etienne, as his third down back behind James Robinson and Carlos Hyde. Meyer referred to Robinson and Hyde as his one-two punch. We want to be top eight in the league. And with James Robinson, Hyde, and Etienne, we think we're there, okay? So this is like really, really an issue that we're already being told what's going to happen in this offense, and we are just disregarding it. And we're saying, no, Travis Etienne is just too talented. We like him too much. We're going to disregard the fact that James Robinson, who's coming off of one of the best rookie seasons for running back ever, is just not going to play uh, a key role, okay? And here's the thing. The, the reality of the situation with Etienne is that he's a rookie, and he's going to be used as a, as a weapon, not a workhorse fantasy running back, okay? We see this every year, and we do it every year. We get super enticed by the talent of these young running backs, and we start to draft them in the 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th round, okay? It was last year with DeAndre Swift, with J.K. Dobbins, with Cam Akers. The year before, it's Miles Sanders. It's all guys going into situations where they already have running backs there. They already have early down backs there, but we're so enticed by the talent that we say that that doesn't matter and the talent will win out and they'll get the workhorse touches. We see it every year. Those guys, while at the end of the year, yeah, it might have been nice to have Cam Akers on your roster. It was horrible rostering him for the first 10 to 12 weeks, right? They're not worth fourth round picks in fantasy where Travis Etienne is gone. If you told me Travis Etienne was an RB1, he was like the RB11 over the last six weeks of the season, that does not 
warrant fourth round draft capital for a guy like Travis Etienne. We, we got to stop learning the same lessons year over year over year with these exciting pass catching rookie running backs. OK, they're going into a role where we already know there's competition there. Urban Meyer compared him to Percy Harvin, right? And he said he wished Kadarius Tony fell to him at 25. Another weapon, okay? He loves weapons. He loves weapons. He doesn't run a real fucking offense. Weapons are not good for fantasy football. Workhorse running backs are. On Twitter, Jared Smola, kind of recap for us, nicely, simply put. Meyer has mentioned Percy Harvin. I'm, I'm reading off the last bullet because I kind of covered all the other ones already. Meyer has mentioned Percy Harvin, Paris Campbell, and Curtis Samuel. Three guys he coached in college when discussing ETN's role. Harvin averaged 3.7 catches and 5.4 carries per game. Campbell, 3.3 catches and 0.5 carries per game. Samuel, 2.7 catches and 4.3 carries per game. Okay? Like, when we start the season and ETN starts off getting 10 touches a game, people are going to act surprised. People are going to be like, what is Urban Meyer doing? It's like he's doing exactly what he fucking told us he was going to do. Good Lord! Sorry. You already know how good James Robinson is. And I get it. It's a different coaching staff. They have no allegiance to James Robinson. Doesn't matter. The best players are going to play. And I'm not saying that James Robinson is better than ETN, but he might be better on early downs. He might be better at the goal line. It's going to be a timeshare for sure. And we're going to be drafting a rookie running back in an unknown timeshare in the fourth round. Like, I am good, man. ETN will probably get eight to 10 carries a game, three to five targets per game. And it's not terrible, but there's not really any. Up it's like DeAndre Swift situation, but worse. There's just not real upside. And who knows? He might get 15% of the goal line carries there in Jacksonville with Robinson and even Carlos Hyde taking fucking five goal line carries on the year. That could be big. And that's not to mention Trevor Lawrence, who's really good on the ground. I don't think we understand just how good he is on the ground. He's super athletic. Over the last two years at Clemson, he scored eight and nine rushing touchdowns. Those are not insignificant numbers. We might see Trevor Lawrence be like a Josh Allen type pest on the goal line where you can't trust any of the running backs to score a lot of touchdowns because he's scoring a touchdown every other game on the goal line. That could very much be a Buffalo Bills type situation. Until his ADP, until Travis Etienne's ADP corrects itself to like the sixth or seventh round, that's when I will be begin to consider pulling the trigger on his ADP. So post NFL draft, underdog drafts, I have zero shares of Travis Etienne. And that will continue to remain the case. Last running back up of the big three. They're the big three, but they are small in stature. We're starting to see a common theme here. And then we'll get to the honorable mentions. The last one, Chase Edmonds of the Arizona Cardinals, man. Currently going off the board of the RB27, 603. I have zero confidence that Cliff is going to give Chase real, real work in 2021. He's had every opportunity to do so over the last couple of years. Like, he's had shitty running backs competing with Chase Edmonds. It's Kenyon Drake, who's whatever at this point in his career. It was David Johnson, who was nothing really outside of pass catching ability at that point of his career. And Cliff Kingsbury just hasn't given him the work. Like, last year, he had every opportunity to. Kenyon Drake had a high ankle sprain. He still didn't do it. I don't think mo most people understand just how few opportunities Chase actually got last year on the ground. He had 97 carries last year. 97 carries. 25 of those carries came in the one game that Kenyon Drake missed with the high ankle sprain. 97, you take out 25 of them from one game, the rest of the 15 games that he played in sprinkled in like three carries a game, four carries a game. It cannot be more obvious that Cliff Kingsbury does not actually want to use Chase Edmonds as a workhorse this year. Kenyon Drake, again, literally the only player that he was competing for carries again last year and couldn't earn the role, couldn't earn a single role, okay? Chase, Chase Edmonds had a single carry inside the five-yard line last year. One single carry. Kenyon Drake had 21 of them. 21 of them. Chase Edmonds, zero goal line carries. Kenyon Drake is gone, but James Conner is here. And James Conner is going to be a much bigger problem for Chase Edmonds' owners than people are pretending he's not going to be. If you don't think Cliff Kingsbury is going to use James Conner like he used Chase Edmonds last year, you're delusional. They're the, they're the same player. Talent-wise, they both bring like the same shit to the field. Connor is going off the board right now is RB 38 at the 907. That's three and a half rounds later than Chase Edmonds. You can give me James Connor over Chase Edmonds at that value all day and tomorrow. Connor's getting the goal line carries. Not to mention again, just like what we said with Trevor Lawrence, and Josh Allen, Kyler Murray stealing goal line carries. He had seven last year, which is seven times more than Chase Edmonds had last year. Okay. Chase Edmonds, fun, spiky player in PPR leagues, right? He will have value in full PPR leagues, of course. He had the six most targets among all running backs last year in the NFL, but that's really where the story starts and where the story ends. He averaged four to five carries a game in the one game he was not the 25 touch guy. 
Okay. And that's not going to be the case this year. Four to five carries. They did not want to give him that workload and he didn't get any goal line carries. So you're looking at a guy that doesn't get the groundwork. He doesn't get any goal line carries. All we're doing is hoping that he catches a lot of passes. And what did the Cardinals do? They added pass catchers. They added Rondell Moore to take away short targets. They added AJ Green for whatever the fuck he is at this point in his career. But it's just Chase Edmonds is just not it at the fifth, sixth round price that you have to pay. You're going to be sorely disappointed. A guy, again, without a ceiling, like the other two backs, DeAndre Swift, Travis Etienne, Chase Edmonds, all very similar players, all very similar situations where the talent is there, but the coaching staff just does not want to give them the work that we want to happen. doesn't matter what we want to happen. doesn't matter. The only thing that matters in fantasy football is what actually happens, okay? And what happens year over year is the middle rounds of running backs, the middle rounds, like the dead zone, the fucking dead people be like zone area of the running back group is like rounds four, five, six, seven. Every year, it's the same fucking thing. And every year, people try to convince themselves that the four, five, six, seven round of running back is where you should be investing. Oh, I like getting wide receivers early. You could just smash the running backs rounds. Like, listen, last year's round four to round six, seven running backs, Fournette. Melvin Gordon, Mark Ingram, Le'Veon Bell, Raheem Mostert, Devin Singletary, Cam Akers, David Montgomery, Kareem Hunt, DeAndre Swift, Ronald Jones, J.K. Dobbins, Jordan Howard. Yes, there were some hits there. There was David Montgomery. There was fucking, like, I don't know. Do you want to consider DeAndre Swift, Ronald Jones, Cam Akers, Melvin Gordon hits? Like, not really. I mean, when you look back at the end of the year points, maybe they were there. This was a year where running backs, the early, the top running backs were hurt for most of the year. Yes, like Melvin Gordon finished maybe as the RB11, but in a normal year when everybody's not dead, he's like the RB16 and you drafted him in the fourth round. It was fucking ugly last year for these middle round running backs. And it's the same thing every year. This is not this is not like an outlier every year. It always happens. And all of these guys, the Chase Edmonds is and the Travis Etienne's, we're going to look back and say, oh, okay, we shouldn't have taken him in the middle rounds. We shouldn't be taking rookies who are in timeshares in the fourth and fifth round like Javante Williams. He is my number one honorable mention player on this list. Just like Travis Etienne going on that rookie point, we need to stop overvaluing rookies in seasonal drafts that don't go into a workhorse situation. Yes, you could look at Najee Harris and you're like, I like the situation because he's got no one to compete against. Najee Harris makes a ton of sense early in draft. Josh Jacobs, who went into Oakland, had no one to compete against. Makes sense. But when we're forcing our way, when we're forcing ourselves to believe that talent will win over when it's not actually just handed to them an opportunity as a workhorse, that's the mindset we got to change here, okay? Because Javante Williams is going to compete with Melvin Gordon. And Melvin Gordon is whatever he is at this point in his career, but he's a very usable running back in the NFL, and he's very much going to have a role. Maybe by week 10, Javante Williams takes over as the starter, and he's the one getting 18-plus touches a game. But by week 10, after you invested a fifth-round pick in seasonal drafts into Javante Williams, who we hope becomes something, we hope Drew Locke can lead this offense, that's crazy to me. So Javante Williams in the fifth round is a problem. The other guy who I'm kind of torn on, and the second honorable mention of this list is Miles Gaskin. Right now at the running back 24, 49th pick overall. I know the system and the offense is ripe for somebody to produce, but Gaskin just seems like the most obvious guy that we're going to look back on a year from now and be like, why the fuck did I draft Miles Gaskin in the fourth round, right? Easy dead zone running back spot, easy situation where anything can come from it. They have no allegiance to him, right? I had so much Miles Gaskin pre NFL draft, eighth, ninth round, ADP Miles Gaskin on underdog. If you want to come draft with me, underdogfantasy.com. Link for the app will be down below. I can't do it anymore. I will be getting no Miles Gaskin in the fourth round. It's I can't sit here and say at the end of 2021, at the, when this fantasy football season is over, we're going to look back and be like, yeah, Miles Gaskin was a workhorse for the full year. Like, I just I just have such a hard time believing in that. I know that, like, a lot of people are going to like Gaskin. He did a lot of good for your teams last year. But the Dolphins, again, like, would you be surprised if the season started and it was a committee with Gaskin and Salvin Ahmed? I wouldn't be surprised if they signed a veteran tomorrow to be in this backfield. Like, it wouldn't surprise me at all. So, Miles Gaskin is a guy I'm treading very lightly on unless his ADP starts to fall a little bit further. I just have zero, zero, zero faith that he remains, like, the starter for the entirety of thy year that's that those are five running backs i think are going far far too high in underdog drafts right now again if you want to draft with me if you want to go see these adps the link for the app is the first thing in the description down below you download it and they're giving away 25 free dollars to whoever deposits right now indefinitely so if you throw ten dollars on there and you use the promo code bdge while you're doing it you're getting $25 on top of that. You could see the ADP on there. You could do basically 10 best ball drafts with the $25 that they're giving to you. And boom, you could avoid Miles Gaskin. 
Okay. You could do what we're doing here and we're going to win money and we're going to fucking diversify the revenue by diversifying the running backs that people like way too much this year. Drop some comments down below. Let me know the running backs you guys are avoiding this year based on ADP. Like I like Mike Davis a lot more than I like Travis Etienne or Miles Gaskin at the end of the fourth round. Give me all the Mike Davis there because there's nothing there to actually compete with. And I trust that they will. I, I trust that his floor is really, really high, regardless of even if he's in like a 55, 45 time split. Um, but let me know who you guys do not like this year for fantasy football at the running back position. We'll do the same thing next week at the wide receiver position, and we'll keep diversifying the content. Let me know what you guys want to see content wise going forward. And, uh, and that's all I got for you today. So hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel if you're new, and I'll see y'all tomorrow on Fade Die Public. We bite, baby. <laughs>